Hey, it's Kevin Lawton with the New Warehouse Podcast, bringing you a new episode today. And on today's episode, I'm going to be joined by Bob Legier, who is head of sales at Cold Cart. And Cold Cart is focusing on the cold chain side of fulfillment. And we're going to dive more into what Cold Cart's all about, how they're approaching the space a little differently. And we're going to talk a little bit too about the differences between fulfilling from the cold chain perspective through uh, versus dry goods and and some of the complications maybe that are there and some of the considerations that uh, companies should be taking when looking at those options. So, Bob, welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me. I'm good. I'm good. Definitely. Definitely. Happy to get you on here. Happy to talk about this. I think it's very interesting uh, what you guys are doing. And I think the space is very interesting too. And one that uh, I think has a lot of questions and, and hopefully you can you can answer those today. So uh, for people that maybe have not heard of Cold Cart yet or are not familiar, why don't you give us kind of a, a brief overview of what you guys do? Yeah. Um, so, so at our core, um, we're a tech company. Um, we've built this uh, nifty proprietary uh, dashboard product interface, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. And really what it helps do um, is make you better at fulfilling your products, whether it's, it's you yourself or, um, you know, a third party. Um, we also optimize for last mile carriers. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to customize as well as keep that customization automated. Um, and, you know, as we were talking about before, uh, we started here, um, our kind of internal joke, uh, because I wouldn't say we fall into a lot of the categories or acronyms that are used in the space. Um, we call our, our system FML because it's built for fulfillment management and logistics. Yeah. And anyone that ships perishable today knows that FML is also the perfect acronym for your, your day-to-day -day life. Uh, it is certainly <laughs> very complicated and challenging. Um, yeah. And as someone who comes from the non-perishable world, um, you know, I, I've, I've definitely seen the, the differences and, and nuances to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's such a, a great acronym uh, to have there, I think, just in the logistics world and in general. Uh, we probably say that on a, a daily basis. Uh, <laughs> things that can, can uh, potentially uh, go wrong or, or just not happen the way you expected them to happen. Um, so so you're, you're coming from um, the dry goods side, right, the ambient side. So, so tell us a little bit about kind of maybe some of the the differences there that you're seeing now being on the, the cold side as well and kind of the temperature regulated side. I mean, what, what are some of the differences between those two things? Yeah, yeah. The, the big thing, um, and it's everyone's favorite topic, is cost. Um, yeah. I don't mean yeah. that in the sense that, oh, one thing's more expensive than the other. But um, as you know, if you were, you know, operating and fulfilling and shipping uh, non-perishable goods, the, the name of the game is always cutting costs. And if yeah. you can find a, a new vendor that's going to save you even a few percent and not um, not make you worse at your job or be a lesser service than what you have today, you're, mm -hmm. you're likely going to go with that vendor or software or service of some kind. Um, that's not the case uh, with with perishable. Um, you know, the, the, the best example is um, when it comes to shipping, because everyone's using uh, hopefully a combination uh, of last mile carriers, but even if they're just using one, the name of the game is, is shipping as few orders in the air as you can, um, mm -hmm. because that's obviously a lot more expensive. And even those like two day, second day service levels, they're not guaranteed most of the time. Um, so when I talk about the, the cost adversity, if you're talking about non-perishable, it's like, okay, if my maximum transit is X, right, whatever I'm telling my customers, I'm going to ship their products to in that speed. Um, I'm going to go around constantly or have someone on my team whose job it is to constantly talk to carriers, see what their pricing is, see what they can offer, uh, and get the lowest price. Um, 
you're not going to necessarily go about it in the same way when you're shipping perishable. And in fact, um, as many people in the perishable space know, sometimes it makes sense to like hold orders. Um, you know, yeah. the, the weather is a huge thing and that's something that our system tracks, uh, and then allows you to prescribe rules based on weather and temperature. So, um, you know, if there's extreme weather in a, in a region of the world, there's a hurricane in Florida. Um, if it's supposed to land tomorrow and you have a hundred orders that should go out today and your transit time is one or two days there, um, you shouldn't ship those because it's almost definitely going to be delayed. Um, so that's the kind of insight you need. And I'm not necessarily saying that you wouldn't hold those orders on the non-perishable side, but yeah. If something gets held at a sorting center and delayed a day or two, yes, you're going to have, you know, potentially some angry customers, but mm -hmm. in the non-perishable space, the order still gets there. It's not ruined. Um, right. And, you know, you give them a, I don't, I'm not, I don't own a brand. So I don't know, a 10% <laughs> off coupon or something for their next order yeah. or some free swag in their next order to uh, make them happy again. On the perishable side, if it gets delayed a day and temperature inside the box goes above a certain degree and it spoils, you're mm. then refunding the entire order. You're losing whatever that cost of good costs of goods are. Um, and that can be in the hundreds of dollars sometimes. Um, yeah. so it just becomes very, very important. Um, another great example too, is like, let's say you are just shipping with FedEx or UPS, uh, and that's your only carrier. If they have a, you know, a hundred clients, uh, that they're picking up for and they're going to the same route, right? So it's something going from Chicago to New York City. Um, we have the ability to potentially limit that exposure to a delay just based on volume, right? Is that if they're yeah. forecasting to deliver a thousand orders on time and they have 1500 that they have to get delivered, some of those are going to be late. Um, yeah. So what we can do is um, help move orders away from there with, you know, another one of our carriers and make sure that we're protecting, you know, 99 of those 100 clients and, and get it there on time. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think certainly there's a lot of kind of complexities, complexities around that um, and challenges too, to kind of navigate. And, and like you said, you know, understand, you know, should should I actually ship this order where, you know, I think there's uh, been so much like push and, and things are in that nature around, you know, getting out the, getting the order out the door as soon as possible. We're here. Like it's more about uh, getting the order out the door at the right time to make sure that that, you know, order is going to be actually like viable and, and usable by the time it's, it's delivered. And, you know, certainly can be a lot of potential cost involved in if there's a delayed shipment or something like that. Um, not only is the customer upset, but they're probably extra upset because they can't even use the product or whatever it is they ordered or consume yeah. it. Uh, and when it gets to them, right. And now they got to wait for it again. And do they even want to, wait for it again you know maybe it was something for a special occasion or something like that but you know i think it's it's very interesting to have that that visibility that you guys are providing like you said you know especially with the the weather situations and and things like that to know okay i should hold this order um or it's okay to let this order go or even from a capacity and volume perspective you know are you know part of these orders just going to get deliver late because it's going to be above the capacity that the carrier can handle or something like that. I think that's uh, really smart to be able to have that level of visibility and, and know those things ahead of time and be proactive because you're going to just lose money either way if that's delayed. Um, so when you look at kind of the cold chain perspective and, you know, there's, um, I feel like I'm seeing, you know, more brands that are coming out with things that are perishable and things like that from an e-commerce perspective, I think because the consumer is more uh, adept or adopted to um, ordering things online, right? So now like ordering things that maybe they wouldn't ever consider ordering before or, or traditionally would pick up from the store because it is perishable, like they're more mm -hmm. geared towards that. So you know, as these companies are coming out and brands are, you know, coming up with new things that are perishable, um, how, how do you advise or like, what 
should companies take into account when they're they're looking for these partners to help them on the cold chain side of things? Yeah, um, you know, we, you actually answered your question. It's all about visibility and, and tracking, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you can find someone um, that's going to give you more visibility, more customization, more flexibility, right? If um, the, the big thing I always bring up is in the non-perishable world, if you and I go start a facility, um, just the two of us, and we bring on one uh, well, one's a bad example, but 10 different clients, right? Yeah. Uh, and we get our daily uh, orders. We're going to try to ship those orders out the exact same way as often as we can, right? Because that's yeah. the traditionally, if you're an operator, that's kind of the most efficient way to do things. If you do that in perishable, you're going to expose yourself to all kinds of risks, right? And I think even without the technology that's been lacking in the perishable space, people have already kind of manually adapted to like seasonal packouts where, you know, you're going to pack your order, the same exact order. If it happens on a monthly basis, let's call it a subscription. Um, you're going to pack that order several different ways, depending on the time of year, because of the weather, um, you're gonna have to use a lot more coolant in the summer. And if we think about like Arizona in the summer, it defies all, perishable fulfillment logic, right? You're yeah. going to want to put 15, maybe 20 pounds of coolant uh, in that package if it's going there. And if you're not in a location super close uh, to areas like that. Um, I also wanted to go back to the point from earlier, just about, you know, costs and, and a little bit less, sure. less uh, risk adverse on costs for perishable. Um, when I was giving that example, right, of going from, uh, Chicago to New York, and the the example had one carrier in play. Um, let's just pretend that they do have multiple carriers in play, but that carrier was chosen because it's the cheapest uh, in the amount of time we have to get it there. Um, to my point, if if that carrier is the cheapest, but we know that they're on time delivery, another thing that our our system tracks for you uh, is eighty five percent, but you know, carrier number two has a 90% or 95% accuracy rating. Um, mm. You're going to, even if that carrier is more expensive by a dollar or two, you're going to pay that extra dollar every time because paying a dollar or two more on shipping, which, you know, in the non-perishable world, people go nuts about, but yeah. in the, in the perishable world, you're going to pay that one or $2 more uh, to have a higher chance of on-time delivery nine times out of 10. The problem is, is that people haven't had visibility into that. And so, you know, kind of the industry standard is like, if you want to talk about like shrink rate, you're basically yeah. accounting for 15% of your orders to have to be reshipped, just depending on where yeah. uh, carriers are, are tracking on the on-time delivery side. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And, and I think that's, you know, such a such a big number too i mean just to factor in and just say like oh yeah well 15 percent of my orders i'm gonna have to redo basically i mean it's a, it's a huge cost and something that you know if you can get a hold of that like it can be a big win i think for your your brand or your, your company uh to be able to to reduce that number and certainly the visibility on that is such a a huge thing because i think there's so many points too at which you know the the temperature could fluctuate or adjust and you know there's so many more points where something could potentially go wrong with that that product in transit or in handling wherever the case may be um so tell us a little bit about i guess you know from that perspective like the, the cold cart solution you know it, is this something where if i'm a brand do I plug into the cold card solution or is this something that I'm looking for like a fulfillment provider to have as a tool, which, which side of the table do I want to be on and from a cold card perspective? Um, well, to, to give you a little inside baseball, it's, it's honestly both. Um, mm. It started uh, as a, a brand focused software, but okay. um I came in and called it out right away. And it wasn't like I was the the catalyst in this. I think mm -hmm. almost everyone internally saw it, but I was like, 
you know, we could turn this into maybe a light WMS because when you think about the process and the trans and the, the automation, the, the transfer of documentation, uh, I think the argument can be made that we're doing just as much for the folks doing fulfillment and in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. third party um, as we are for the brands, right? The, the brands love the visibility and the ability to uh, prescribe and change rules based on all types of metrics. Um, but when it comes to the flow on the floor, um, mm -hmm. we take a bunch of really complex logic and boil it down into basically three labels, right? There's a, a wave summary that shows what needs to be picked at this location uh, to run this brand's uh, and fulfill, sorry, to pick and pack this brand's orders. And then there's um, subjective pick tickets and shipping labels associated with every order. So the wave summary, obviously, like I said, tells you everything that you need to get today to fulfill. Um, but the pick tickets and shipping labels have taken into account any of these processing and packaging rules you've put in place. Um, mm. so if we go back to that, like weather based rule, yeah. um, you can have something, and this is in my opinion, better than like a, a seasonal pack out solution, because if you have a weather based rule and let's just say it's, if it's 80 degrees or higher at the destination, ship something this way. Generally that's mm. like add five more pounds of dry ice or something like that. Um, that's going to be in play all year. So it doesn't matter if it's 80 degrees in New Jersey in the summer or 80 yeah. degrees in Florida in the winter, right? Because if it's 80 degrees in Florida in the winter and you have your winter standard pack out and you're not aware of that weather um, and no one's tracking it, even that box is going to be risk adverse or I'm sorry, extra risk to uh, yeah. potentially thaw. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that it's taking that into account in, in real time, because I think there's so much fluctuation there and challenges to, you know, be able to just put in kind of a, like a broad, like you're saying, kind of seasonal pack out rule. Um, there's so much variation there and what's going on. Like, you know, cause even now, I mean, we see too, like, you know, just random crazy spikes in temperature and places and times of the year where you would be expecting it to be cold, but it's actually like not that cold anymore. And, you know, I think seeing that and understanding what's going on and, you know, obviously I, I think like an individual could not be mm -hmm. able to, you know, do that in a very efficient way. So having the system do that for you, I think is, is really a, a great thing. So, so, I mean, are you seeing where, uh, third party providers are kind of bringing in cold car to almost be like a, a value add to their clients or potential clients? Yeah, that's where that's what we're working on um, or mm -hmm. what I'm working on, right, is having those conversations with some of our partners and saying, hey, you know, where you know, here's what we have today. Where does this need to be for you to not necessarily run your entire facility? Because uh, like, you know, for example, our system's not going to say use this pick journey and go to this location to pick these. It's yeah. just going to give you what you need. Um, and believe it or not, like sometimes that's all you need, uh, mostly talking about folks doing 1P fulfillment. But, um, you know, even on the 3PL side, um, that level of automation and stuff, basically, we're just now gathering a lot of feedback on, you know, where, where we're at today and where we need to be um, to make that something that they can confidently invest and commit in. Um, and then just like you called out, right? If, if the site's using cold cart, it just makes it that much more advantageous for all the clients in that facility that are perishable yeah. to also be using cold cart and it's all, all connected. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you're getting the, the feedback too from them to see like, you know, what else do we need to, to add or where do we need to be and how do we continue to, to evolve this? So it's meeting all those needs there. And, uh, I'm curious too. I mean, you know, as you're, uh, you know, exploring this space and talking to people and what they they're looking for, both on the the brand side and also the provider side, um, you know, there's certainly been a lot of talk over the last couple of years about challenges with cold storage and you know limited availability and and things like that. And you know, there's only you know a couple 
handful of big time providers and you know they're mm-hmm. not always the the best right so oh yeah it's like <laughs> what are you seeing out there in the market in terms of you know people trying to address like this this space and capacity issue on the the cold side yeah um so you know i this is very much entrenched from my days at Chip Bob, but I believe that there is more value in partnering with brands early on um, mm. and growing alongside them um, than you know the game that these big uh, nationwide cold chain fulfillment centers are playing. They're just they're going around and trying to steal all the biggest volume shippers and you know cut costs by like I, like I said earlier two three percent whatever it is. That's a really tough game to play. And that's, I mean, you know, from the sales side, that's a really tough sale uh, because you have to take that and use it as motivation to upend, you know, a multi-million dollar day-to-day operation. Right. Um, so, you know, as much as I am talking to, to larger brands, um, I think that where the industry's at, um, it's kind of like when I used to, when I worked at Chip Bob, I would use the, the music analogy where it was like, I started at that company when it was a garage band and we were mm. like headlining music festivals when I left. Um, and that's what excites me about Perishable is because it reminds me of where the, the non-perishable e-commerce industry was, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, so because of that, there's going to be these brands that, yeah, they do, you know, a hundred orders a week, but Getting there, if anyone's ever gone out and started a brand, getting to 100 orders a week isn't easy. Um, And so I think that there's a lot of value in in partnering with brands um, early on and allowing them to grow. Um, You know, some of the some of the biggest brands that I've ever worked with sometimes started as a a Um, pre-launch. So there's there's definitely something to be said for that. Um, And I think that. The more if you if you own a cold chain facility, um, I think the more you can adopt to that as long as you're protecting your costs and making sure you're not bringing in 100 clients that just collect dust. Um, I think adopting to that mindset a little bit more uh, and being a little more eager to allow brands to to grow with you um, is a lot easier to to get them in the door rather than wait till they're at 10,000 shipments a month and more or less happy with what they're doing and try to, you know, squeeze pennies out of it and undercut something and and get them to go from five locations into five of your locations in different parts of the country. It's a, it's a very big move. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's like really good uh, advice there too. I mean, to, you know, kind of grow with them because I think it is, you know, a lot. uh, And I agree with you too, that, you know, in, the e-commerce space, I feel like the perishable is still kind of just being penetrated in a sense and being grown a little more. And I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the kind of the consumer mindset is more attuned now to ordering things that maybe uh, they were kind of on the fence about, you know, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, And now like it's just becoming more, you know, second nature to just, you know, get almost everything online. Right. And, and, and so I think it's interesting to see that grow. And I think that there is like opportunity there. And I, I'm curious your thoughts on this too, because there's a lot of talk about, you know, just from like an e-commerce fulfillment provider, or 3PL um, perspective that, you know, there may be some, some consolidation or maybe like it's slowing down in, in growth. Um, Cause there's just, you know, it was like kind of a spike in providers around like the e-commerce boom and all these things. But uh, I mean, how do you think that opportunity, or is there more opportunity maybe on the, the cold side of things than there is on the ambient side of things for uh, 3PL providers out there? I mean, what do you think the, the balance is there? Um, that's a, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so you know, that's, that's definitely a big reason why I chose to jump into to perishable. 
Um, yep. Obviously, from just a very selfish perspective, it's just a great way for me to diversify and learn something new without, you know, necessarily jumping into just a, a completely brand new industry. Um, so it's it's definitely a way for me to like level up on my my operations sided mind and learn about the the differences and stuff. Um, but like I said, I, I think that this if this industry is truly 10 years behind where non-perishable is um, and there's that opportunity to just like when, you know, folks go from one company to another, you take all the stuff that's good and you adopt that and apply it. And then the stuff that went bad, you give insight to the people at your new organization and say, ah, we tried that and it didn't work. And and here's why. So we can, we can get to something that works, but we should do it this way rather than the way we did it last time. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's the other thing too, is that's, or this goes back to my last point, which is like, there's going to be a lot more of these smaller brands that need partners to grow alongside because they're running something, um, very complex with a lot of customization, um, that needs a lot of flexibility. And you come to find that they're running their entire operation, uh, with like ship station, which no, yeah. I love ship station, no shade at ship station, yeah. but, uh, when you need weather-based rules and, and all this kinds of stuff and, and inventory tracking and stuff like that, um, it just doesn't come with that. So, mm. um, you know, that's kind of where we're positioning ourselves is it's a, it's a great way to level up, uh, transparency, automation. Um, and basically once, like once you're go, once you go through onboarding with cold cart, um, aside from the physical stuff, like sending inventory and, and buttoning up your supply chain from a, from a user perspective on the software side, you're basically in like data monitoring mode. You're making sure that we're sending all your batches to the site or sites that you're shipping out of. You're making sure, all the costs are in line. Um, we can track all your all your costs. So we can track, you know, last mile packaging, pick and pack costs. Everything is very transparently in the dashboard, both at a high level. So you can look at like, you know, what your costs were for six months on on this specific cost. You can also uh, get a, um, a a list of your costs in each order. Um, so that's what's most important because. When you think about the value, right, you can show all the bells and whistles um, on, on, a, on a piece of software, but what does it actually calculate to in savings? And that's where it's like having a rule-based logic on weather versus having a seasonal pack out means that there's going to be a hundred orders over the winter where it's still going somewhere very warm because it's just a, you know, um, uh, a not normally warm year in Arizona or Florida or both. Um, and you get exposed to that kind of stuff. Um, so that's where the, the fine tuning really ends up adding, really ends up adding up, um, on, yeah. on your savings and cost. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's, you know, great that you, you brought that up and, you know, all the way to that, that breakdown on the cost side, because at the end of the day, that's really, kind of what matters and what's going to, you know, help you understand like where your business is at and how you can improve on some things and then really have that overall visibility that you guys are providing with the cold cart solution. So, so I think it's really great to, to talk to you and it's been super insightful on the, the cold chain perspective and what you guys are trying to do at cold cart and how you're addressing some of these uh, problems and, and creating better visibility uh, into some of these things. Like I love the, the weather um, tracking and, you know, notifications and things like that. Um, so super interesting talking to you here, Bob, and really appreciate you coming on the the show. Uh, if people Likewise, are sir. interested in learning more about cold cart, what's the best way to do that? Yeah. Um, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, you can go to coldcart.co. Uh, that's our website. Um, if you fill out a form, uh, we will get back to you ASAP. Um, and even if you're not um, looking for perishable uh, fulfillment or software or anything that cold cards doing, um, I have my own website, uh, egrowthadvisors.com. Um, and I, along with one of my uh, old colleagues, consult on, you know, 3PLs, particularly 
how do you level up your sales on the three PL side? Cause a lot of three PLs are just like, you know, paying for clicks and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. so we consult on that kind of stuff. And then obviously how do brands, um, diversify on the carrier side, on the three PL side, um, and ultimately just, you know, different ways to, uh, grow and scale their businesses. All right, great. And great to get that information. And we'll definitely put all those links so people can easily find them at the new warehouse.com as well. So Bob, thank you once again for your time on the show today. Thanks so much, Kevin. It was great to meet you. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning into today's video here on our YouTube channel, the new warehouse podcast. And I appreciate you tuning in. If you liked what you saw, make sure you subscribe to our channel. And if you like this video in particular, make sure you like it as well. And if you want to get this great t-shirt that you see in the video behind me, warehouses are sexy, head to warehousesaresexy.com and get your own.